Hey, how's it going, everyone? And welcome to episode 8 of Restless Radio. This is an episodic podcast diving headfirst into the wacky and wonderful world of professional wrestling. I'm your host and longtime wrestling fan, Julian, the console pleb Concilio, merely existing in this PC master race world. <laughs> and joining me on this log flume adventure ride and as the overall coolest perspective in this equation, he is the smoking hot smoker himself, Scott Nenanovich. Scott, how's it going? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good today. Thank you, Julian. Are you looking forward to what we have in store today? Because it's a doozy. Oh, I can't wait to start undertaking this episode. Oh, it's very appropriate for today. Yep. Yeah. I want to actually test you a little bit before we get started, because I think you've been progressing pretty well in your knowledge of wrestling. It seems like you are getting interested in wrestling a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say it's, it's, you know, it's something that you would look forward to watching and look forward to experiencing oh most definitely yeah since we've started the podcast i have definitely gained a greater appreciation for what wrestling is i know what parts of wrestling that i like what i look most forward to in matches yeah and still like being exposed to new stuff and that whole journey of discovery i'm really enjoying that yeah, it, it, I think it is, for a new fan, it would be very, or well, kind of, you know, optimistic, especially looking at something that's brand new to you. Mm. We've got a couple of people on the screen right now. I kind of want to test your knowledge as to who these two people are. Yeah. It might give you a hint as to what we're watching today, but we have a couple of commentators on screen, and we've seen these commentators and we've heard these commentators <laughs> for many episodes now. Yep. And I've probably mentioned both their names numerous times, but I want to kind of quiz you as to who these two commentators are. One's in a cowboy hat, yep. and the other is in a king outfit. He looks like a Burger King, but who knows? Yep. What are their names? Their names are... We've got uh, Jack the Black Hat Johnson. Yep. And Randy Redcoat with Cool Shoulders Johnson. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> you're, you're almost, almost. <laughs> yeah. So on the left, we've got Jim Ross in the cowboy hat. I, I got the... No. Johnson. J- that kind of sounds like Jim. Yeah, no. JR Jim Ross. Yeah. Which we'll be hearing a lot of and his famous calls. And on the right, Jerry the King Lawler. I got the J's right. You got the J's right. You got you, you know, a lot of alpha, a lot of letters in the alphabet there. <laughs> Do you hear something, Scott? It sounds like jets are flying over. It sounds like explosions are happening in the background. It sounds like danger. Oh, a zone. Oh of yeah. Danger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In like a sequential series. Yes, the Danger Zone series, of course. I'm afraid Kenny Loggins couldn't be here, but what is here is some wild and reckless matches. Yes, that's right, I am walking Scott through the minefield of stipulations, high spots, and violent encounters with everything in between. It's a great way to show you how innovative wrestling can be, and especially when the rules are thrown way out the window. Well, I mean... I don't know how I feel about this Danger Zone series, because after... So we did our first episode, which I really enjoyed, and then we did the Danger Zone series episode, and I questioned why I was doing this podcast. Exactly. I did you, not like the violence. You did and not the enjoy it. Because you are a pacifist. Yeah. And, uh, you solve your problems with words, don't you? I hope... Oh, definitely. Yeah. And I hope that you have curated this match... I mean, it's only one so match. that I don't want to run away. It's only one match, but it is one of the most iconic matches in wrestling history, so I think it's pretty uh, important for me to show you this. Mm-hmm. And, conveniently, it actually fits into our timeline of Austin versus McMahon, so it is kind of relevant to what we're talking about. What a master host you are, I Julian. Know. <laughs> God, sometimes... <laughs> I can't believe myself sometimes. And I believe this is a necessary pit stop in our timeline. We've seen Dude Love in our last episode. Yep. And we were experiencing his other character, or alter ego, Mankind. Mm-hmm. 
As for what you're about to watch, it is considered to be one of the most iconic matches in wrestling history. Not just WWE, all of wrestling. Wow. Some say it set the bar so high for death-defying spots, it would be impossible to top it, and I can safely say, from the comfort of this couch with two feet planted on the ground, it has never been topped. Many have tried to capture the same emotion 17,000 people in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania felt that night, and this year marks the 20th anniversary since this match. We are of course watching Mankind versus The Undertaker in a Hell in a Cell match at King of the Ring 1998. Oh look at his little crown there! Yeah, on the table! Oh, he's a king! <laughs> yeah, he's like a king! This is your first cage match! Cage matches are a big staple in wrestling. Yeah. It's kind of a cliche, the cage match. Well, I mean, you know. I don't know why. Uh, this is just a big cage <laughs> with a top on it. <laughs> why does it need a top on it? So that I don't get thrown so out of the can't, ring. You can't escape, is the idea. No escape from the, from the hell in the cell. Do they, like, try and climb up the walls and then get out of the hell in the cell? Well, you'll we'll find out in this match, maybe. <laughs> What's he got there? A chair? <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's pretty obvious. Look at your monitor, King. <laughs> what the hell's he doing up there? <laughs> oh shit! Yeah. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> You're gonna fucking do it. Yeah. The front row seats would be pretty shit if you had to watch the whole match from up there. Yeah. Just <laughs> be like, why the pay money for this? <laughs> Watch him from underneath. <laughs> Holy shit! Jesus! Yeah. Oh my god. Is it always a Spanish table that gets destroyed first? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the inside joke. <laughs> it's like, Spanish, Spanish announced table always gets destroyed. My god. I mean, he's got a bit of fat on him, but that's not going to protect him that much. He's landing on wood. Are they going to put mankind on top of the stretcher? And then Undertaker's going to fucking jump off and land on the stretcher. No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> it's literally suicide. <laughs> what are you thinking? Far out. Why the hell would you do that to yourself? For the sake of entertainment. What do you think of man kind of He's a fucking psycho. It's like he loves pain. That isn't a snot, by the way. Sticking out of his nose. That's a tooth. What? Taking two bumps like that and still wrestling. Yeah. Notice you're pretty silent. For this match. Yeah. Full on. It is full on. It is as real as it gets. Oh. oh no! 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 Why is there thumbtacks under the ring? No! Don't knock me down on that! 
Just fucking put him in your shoes and do a little dance. Oh no. Fucking Mick Foley's gonna be thrown into that, isn't he? Oh no. Oh no. See half of the thumbtacks fall out of his back? Oh. Look on the bright side, Mick. You can do a cool tap dance now. <laughs> so we've seen one of the most iconic matches because of the complete disregard for human safety. Nowadays, the match would have been stopped, but I guess... If it was, we probably wouldn't be talking about it on a podcast right now. Before the match started, Jim Ross said the Hell in a Cell is custom built for injury. The foreshadowing in that statement is mm. pretty ridiculous. It's infamous for two spots, but I would argue the whole match is brutal. Mm. Scott, you're a person who's being thrown into the deep end here in terms of seeing the reality and the toll wrestling can take on the human body, but you're also seeing the unbelievable willpower of one man to put on a fucking memorable show. Mm. I've seen this match many, many times, and I still get goosebumps watching it. As simple as it is, what are your immediate thoughts? Well, I have one note here of my notepad. Yeah. It says, that was fucked. <laughs> yep. I, yeah, I, have to, I do not know what, I do not know why someone would want to put them through, put themselves through that injury. Yeah, it is a pretty uh, hefty ask for somebody. And like I, it's I don't insane. think any, I honestly think nobody forced him to do something like that. I think it's his own willpower to mm. to make something memorable. I think the most fascinating thing was while we're watching your your complete speechless. Mm. throughout it and I, I thought that was the most fascinating because i think like in terms of a i don't know if you want to call this podcast a social experiment or whatnot mm. you know getting a live reaction from somebody who's never really watched wrestling a whole lot mm. and seeing this kind of reality of it yeah well usually during matches i'm like laughing and, like, and you, you were like that at I the make beginning. a lot of noise you were, you were obviously making jokes and all that stuff And I, I kind of kept quiet Because I was like you don't know what you're in for in a second <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of just waiting to see When the reality hit you In the face Yeah, And it did And obviously It's a pretty uh, heavy subject this match mm. Not just as a match itself It's a subject because it's it's also Questioning how much pain wrestlers have to put themselves through or to get noticed. Or when you should probably stop a match. Mm. When it should be stopped. So, is this the time when The Undertaker was a locker room leader? Uh, yeah, I would say he would be at this point. <laughs> I'd um, say he's a fucking piece of shit. Well... Because if Mick Foley comes up to him and goes, You know what? I want you to throw me off the top of the cage onto the table. That'd be really cool, right? Well, if you're a freaking leader, you're going to be like, nah, mate, I'm not going to fucking do that. Well, from what I've read, it took a lot of convincing from Mick to get him to do that. But before we get into the, okay. the backstage sort of discussion about this match, I want to give you a bit of background about Mick Foley to understand the person himself. Yep. The man behind the character Mankind. Uh, Mrs. Foley's baby boy, as he's been dubbed, from Long Island, New York. Mm -hmm. Mick started wrestling around the 80s when wrestling had territories still. He was mainly an enhancement talent, so essentially a jobber putting guys over. Mm -hmm. He was obviously never a, a person with a wonderful physique. He was always, you know, kind of a bit... A man with carriage. Think of it that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was never a body person, and he 
came up in wrestling when having a great body was everything. Mm. You know, he was, you know, starting from the bottom and he was an underdog in that, in that sense. And he was basically an enhancement talent until he came up with the character Cactus Jack. What do you think of that name? <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> Cactus Jack. Which was basically this sort of unstable, hardcore wrestler. So Cactus was primarily known for hardcore and deathmatch style wrestling. Yeah. And a lot of Cactus's notoriety came from matches in Japan. And he wrestled for various promotions over there. Okay. And they would often use a lot of barbed wire, thumbtacks, C4 explosions, broken glass. C4 explosions. Yes, uh, barbed wire exploding matches. Oh. Yes, and he also wrestled for WCW and ECW. So he did wrestle in the, in the States as well. And he had some success there. But by 1996, he was in the WWF and Vince repackaged him as Mankind. This was 96, so Cactus Jack probably wouldn't fit in the family-friendly product they were producing at the time. Mm -hmm. So Mankind was essentially a deranged, schizophrenic character. An actually really compelling character. He had a rat named George. (laughs) (laughs) He wore a leather mask, and he actually used to pull out his hair in matches. Wow. And he used to squeal at people like a pig. A okay. very, a very disturbing, dark character. Yeah, okay. and the commentators would put a, put over how much he enjoyed pain, and we saw that in obviously in the Hell in a Cell match. Yeah, he was a really, really dark character. Him and Jim Ross would do sit down interviews where Mankind would spill out details of his upbringing and his his past or his views on the world and all that. Mm. It's like really a deep character for the time, especially in '96 when you still had those cartoon characters. You had this mm. really disturbing, almost very gothic sort of character, Mankind. Then, of course, Dude Love came in at some point, and eventually so did Cactus Jack. So by 97, 98, he was altering between all three characters. Yeah. <laughs> These three completely different characters. And how, like, did, how did they back to that? Like, I mean, it was obviously, the commentators couldn't ignore the fact that it's... They used to call him Mick Foley. <laughs> He's his other character, Dude Love. And so obviously the commentators couldn't ignore the fact that, yes, there just is one man playing three characters. Uh, but they used to call it the Three Faces of Foley, is yeah. what the characters were dubbed as. And I think now it's time to probably get into the match notes. So Mankind comes out, but Mankind starts on top of the cell, climbs up there before he does that he kind of just surveys the cell a little bit opens and closes the door and obviously he's still this deranged uh Mm. you know unstable person but he does climb the cell and then the undertaker comes out this is your first undertaker match what do you think of him ah i love his presence the entrance when he walks out i loved his uh get up yeah you know it looked like he had stepped out of hell he looked like a mean motherfucker. Oh, like, yeah. Don't want to see him in a dark place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> he essentially looks like the Grim Reaper. Pretty much. Yeah. The costume, <clears throat> very well done. Pretty readily angered his character. Yeah, always a stern look on his face. And never. It's one of the very few method actor characters. Mm. Uh, in wrestling, the Undertaker's character. Well, it doesn't have really have to do that much. Well, no. It's, it's still, like, really cool. Like, the character has had that longevity just because it's a simple character. It's just, it's a dark, gothic-like person. Mm. So, Mankind throws a chair up top of the cell. Undertaker, obviously, when he comes out, he follows up there with him. Mankind throws a couple chair shots to the Undertaker. Those are pretty loud, echoing around the arena. And then they get towards the edge of the Hell in a Cell, and it kind of catches everyone by surprise. Undertaker throws Mankind off the Hell in a Cell through the announce table. Yeah, that was horrible. That, um, no crash mats, no padding. He didn't have a suit on underneath that had some padding on it. There was no crash mats underneath the the announce table. It was literally just landing on wood. Yeah, it, like the you couldn't get a more authentic spot 
you know, looking like an accident, like a horrible mm. accident as that. And the commentators didn't know that was going to happen. Their reaction is completely authentic. Yeah. Jim Ross screaming. That was their real reaction. That was JR's reaction. And like that's one of the calls of the century. That that line like is quoted, you know. This, this match is 20 years old and still being quoted, that line. Yeah. So, yeah, JR and Jerry Lawler's reactions throughout this match are completely authentic. But a stretcher does come out and the cage is raised up as the Undertaker is still on top. The sh- a lot of EMTs, a lot of backstage personnel. Terry mm. Funk was out there, who the commentators mentioned that they, they've had problems in the past, Mick Foley and, and uh, Terry Funk. Obviously, that's more kayfabe stuff. Mm. Yeah, Vince McMahon is out there looking very concerned. Did you happen to notice Vince there as well? I, I, they, I heard them mention Vince, yeah. but I couldn't spot him. They did cut to him for very briefly and he did look very very concerned yeah they thought mick was dead (laughs) when he landed like terry funk who was the first person there to check on him yeah thought he was dead (laughs) and that like i don't blame them for thinking that because it was a hell of a fucking bump oh yeah and the internal injuries he would have suffered from that was ridiculous it went for a very long time. Yeah, that while that they were that off period of where from the time he fell to where he gets eventually gets back up was probably about ten minutes. Yeah, you know, of the audience just stunned as well. The entire seventeen thousand people just, you know, speechless. Like there was no noise being made. I think he did get a bit of a standing ovation when he was getting wheeled out into the aisleway. But mm. when he does get wheeled into the aisle, eh, he rolls off the stretcher and everything's got, everyone's kind of curious what's going on. Why did you just roll off the stretcher? Camera cuts back to the aisle. Eh? The Undertaker started climbing down, but Mick Foley is up and he's <laughs> walking towards the cage again. And I don't know about you, but whenever I see that, like I get instant goosebumps when I see that. They're like ridiculous because JR at the same time is calling... <laughs> He's standing. Oh my God! And look at this. He's got a smile on his face. For God's sakes! Are you kidding me? He wants to go back up. Uh uh-uh. uh Mankind is going back up. No way! And so is the Undertaker. No way! <laughs> and they're basically putting over how indestructible he is at the same time. Like he won't stay down. Mm. You know. So Mick Foley. I'm not going to call him Mankind anymore. I'm calling him Mick Foley from now on. Yep. He climbs back up the cage and so does the Undertaker. They both meet in the middle. They're not up there for very long. Undertaker grabs a chair, hits him with it. Uh, It's thrown onto one panel of the cell. Mm -hmm. And Undertaker choke slams him through the cell, landing into the ring (laughs) with a massive fucking thud. Oh, yeah. And... JR says that ring is like concrete, and it is. Those old, those old WWF rings were like concrete. Very little give on them. Like, nowadays, it's a lot more safer, the rings, but back then, they were fucking hard. Yeah. And to take bums like that, and to take a bump like that, is absolutely ridiculous. Now, there's a couple of disputing facts about that spot. Was it planned, or was it not? What do you think? Mm. Was he meant to go through that cell? Well, at, at the start of the match, they, when they first were on the top, yeah, they were up there kind of doing like a couple of moves to test it out before they actually, before the Undertaker threw Mike Foley off. And they Mick did, Foley. Mick Foley. Mike Foley. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, man. <laughs> they were just testing. They were testing and like, the, the roof of the cage gave a little bit. Yes. Probably because it wasn't designed to have people on top of it. Well, actually, now that you mentioned that, uh, the prop person who was uh, putting the cage together actually did design the cage to have those breakable spots. 
Yeah. To have actual a bit of drama, seeing two people's legs go through it. Oh no. Yeah. You know there were there was spots where the the cage was meant to kind of give way just a little bit. Mm. The panel that Mick went through was not meant to break all the way through. It was only meant to break a little bit, and then Undertaker was meant to roll him through into the ring, and he would land safely in the ring. It was completely unplanned for Mick to go right through it yeah. into the ring. And you notice Mick doesn't jump when he takes that choke slam. He isn't trying to go through it. He literally just kind of falls back, and it gives way. Yeah. You know, so... It was a completely unplanned spot. Nobody was expecting that to happen. You know, it completely threw everyone off guard. Obviously, the, und- the Undertaker at that point thought Mick was dead. Oh, shit. Twice now. <laughs> <laughs> and did you notice the chair that was on the panel as he came down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you notice that chair? That chair hit him in the face as he was coming down and it broke his teeth. Oh... So I, I said earlier in the thing that the teeth, that one of his teeth went through his lip. That was actually incorrect. It was actually kind of a bit more bizarre. The tooth actually came out of his mouth and managed to land on his face as he was coming down. Oh! So kind of a bit of a fluke sort of uh, moment there, but still pretty gnarly anyway. He smashed his mouth up with that chair. So obviously at this point, JR is like going off his nut. <laughs> They're like, stop the fucking match. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> Everyone is in the ring. The Undertaker climbs down and he choke slams Terry Funk. Yeah. He gets choke, choke slammed out of his shoes. <laughs> I remember a quote from Mick, who at the time was pretty much concussed and didn't know what the hell was going on. He remembers just seeing a pair of sneakers in the, sh- in the ring and was wondering why there was a pair of sneakers in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there is a moment where The Undertaker punches Mick Foley and he crumbles to the mat. He mm. literally just collapses in a heap and it looked like Mick was completely out of it. Completely unconscious, pretty much. Mm. Uh, Mick goes to pick up the steel steps but drops them immediately. He has a dislocated shoulder at this point. Oh my goodness. Yeah, he drops them immediately and you could tell just... His arm is basically dangling. There's a lot of fighting around the outside. Mick actually does get offense in this match, surprisingly. (laughs) There's one point where he pile drives The Undertaker on a steel chair. Yeah. That looked pretty fucking brutal. Uh, He goes under the ring to get a sack. What's in the sack, Scott? Thumbtacks. Thumbtacks are in the sack, Scott. And he pours the thousands and thousands of thumbtacks onto the mat. It's pretty important in wrestling to have a steady supply of thumbtacks yeah well you never know when you're gonna have a notice board and near the by the ring and yeah you know a lot of crimes happen around the ring so you want to have a notice board where you can kind of wrap string around (laughs) them and connect the clues together (laughs) yeah if you know what i mean so there's thousands of thumbtacks are poured onto the mat mankind goes for the mandible claw and jumps on taker's back undertaker backs up towards the tacks and drops him back first onto them JR screams he's like a human pincushion. Yeah. You notice that one? Mankind gets up again, though. He literally gets up straight away. Undertaker grabs him by the throat and choke slams him onto the tacks, which looked even more brutal than the first time. Yep. And and he has a dislocated shoulder at this point. Yes. Uh, well, well, we'll go through the list of injuries in a second. Mankind <laughs> gets up once again. And the Undertaker gives him the Tombstone Pile Driver, which is his finisher, mm. and he gets the win. That that was, you know. At least he didn't do that finisher on the tax. No, he, he was nice and did it where the tax weren't there. <laughs> uh, this match is just a fucking barn burner as a memorable match, a cautious tale, I would say. I mm. wouldn't say it's you know a a classic. 
encounter between two um, you know, amazing technicians. It is just a brutal, you know, it ain't for the faint of heart to watch this. Um, even 20 years later, it still isn't, it still holds up as brutal as it was in 98. It still is brutal in 2018. In terms of, uh, you know, your viewpoints on this, like, would you ever watch this match again? Probably not. Just for its brutality, you wouldn't do it? It's just insane risk. Mm. So much, per- like, risk to personal, in- like, injury. And for what? What if he died? What if he broke his neck and became paralyzed? Yeah, that, that is the extreme risks wrestlers take. I'm guessing that they never, ever tested this move. There's no rehearsal. Yeah, you know, like... There's no rehearsal process where they threw him off first mm. for the match. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, obviously... Good try, Mick. <laughs> Still one more time, we'll get it right. <laughs> Just practice on crash mats first. Yes, wrestling is risky. Yes, the high-flying action, risky, but they can practice that. Yeah, you can't practice this. This is just like... One take, that's all you've got. Let's do this. Should be alright. Do you want me to list the list of injuries that Mick sustained? (sighs) I'm not going to believe it. Go on. Alright, so two missing teeth, multiple stitches below his lip, a dislocated jaw, concussion bruised kidney and a dislocated shoulder do you, do you know how much time off Mick got after this six months two weeks <laughs> what he got two weeks off and he continued wrestling for a few more months after it Mick did permanent da- damage to his body uh, he walks with a limp because of this match uh, he also changed his mentality for wrestling in general I mean, if you want to look at the positive sides of what came out of this match, he didn't take risks anymore. He didn't. He took calculated risks. And mm. sadly, Mick retired from full-time wrestling two years after this, at a you know the age of early thirties, which is pretty young to be retiring from full-time. Mm. But that was. It wasn't just this match. It was also the long list of injuries and damage that he's done prior to his career. Mm. Yeah, Mick lost an ear, half an ear in Germany. Yeah, I, you picked I, up I on picked that. I picked up on that, and they said he has half an ear. I yes. think it was uh, Jim Ross that said that. Yes, in a match. And I was in like, Germany. oh, is this real, or are they just like talking shit about this character? Yes, in a match in Germany, he lost half an ear. Basically, it was a spot where he would tangle himself in the ropes um, from around his head. Someone prior to the match had tightened the ropes too much. And the ropes were actually strangling Mick. And Mick had to force his way out of it. And as the ropes were coming off his face, it tore off half his ear. So it was a ridiculous accident that shouldn't have happened, but it did. I guess it added to the Cactus Jack character. (laughs) Losing half an ear in Germany. Because every time (laughs) Cactus Jack wrestled, that was always brought up. And so I guess if you want to look at positives from that. But in terms of Mick... And his career after Hell in a Cell, like Mick, don't get me wrong, Mick is a very, very smart person. He's not a dumb person to be taking these kinds of risks. In 1999, he actually released an autobiography that he wrote by hand, and it made the New York Times bestseller list of 1999. Hmm. Mick is a very, very intelligent person. He's like a full-time author. He's written various books after his you know, retirement from wrestling, he's written children's books, he's written other autobiographies. He's one of the very few people that I've known who has multiple autobiographies. I don't know why. <laughs> huh. It's kind of a funny thing. But yes, Mick is a very, very intelligent person. After this match, though, the Mankind character became a more humanized character. Obviously, people saw him in a more sympathetic light because he had literally just killed his body For the entertainment of the fans. And so how can you fucking boo that man? He was the heel going into that match and he came out of babyface. He Mm. got a standing ovation when he was walking out of that arena. And deservedly so. Mm. Because it was an amazing performance regardless of the risks he took. After the match, he became actually more of a comedic character. 
Mick had some comedic chops. Mm. He found a way to still entertain people but without putting his body at risk. And we actually get to see some of that comedy in our Austin vs. McMahon timeline. So we actually do get to see the positives of this uh, Hell in a Cell match. <laughs> as dark and as heavy as it is, you know, there are positives from it. Mm. And I think the, po- the main positive, I would say, is that it is a caution and tale. For yeah. any future wrestlers taking risks like that. Yeah, well, this is like the the danger. I want to do this stunt. Well, you know, you remember what happened to good old Mick Foley. Well, I, I would like to think that it did scare people from not doing high-risk stuff like that. But obviously, on the independent circuit, there isn't any regulation. There isn't anybody telling you, hey, maybe you shouldn't do that. Or mm-hmm. maybe you won't do that. I won't let you do that. But unfortunately, wrestlers still do it. And it's the independent circuit, so people still do these kinds of stunts. Mm. Um, I would like to think that they do take a bit more precaution when they do it. And maybe putting down crash mats or maybe mm. doing something else to kind of you know reduce the risk. Mm. Obviously, people would most likely take that into consideration before jumping off something pretty high. <laughs> yeah, well, he jumped backwards you don't really have any control on where you're going to land if you jump backwards yeah gravity did, the, did especially the work if you're him. not like you know if he, you haven't practiced before if he under under jumped or over jumped he would have hit the guardrail or he would have landed straight on the floor yeah the hitting the guardrail the margin for error ra- was so minuscule for that sorry that would well landing on the guardrail his head he probably would have died mm-hmm. or been permanently handicapped. Yeah, he could have been I, per- irreparable damage, yes. Yeah, I mean, landing on the concrete would have been uh, very bad as yeah. well, you know, from that height. Or even if he under, sh- under hit and only his head landed on the table. Yeah. You know, similar injury to the guardrail. Yeah. Like, that's just insane. You can't. I can't believe it. Sometimes people have kind of said to Mick that he, you know, he's a glorified stuntman, and I think that's a bit of a disrespectful sort of term to give him that because I, I would give more Mick more credit as a wrestler. You know, in terms of the risks that he took, he's he's always had the had the mentality to always just put the fans entertainment before his own well-being and i guess that came comes at a price and he's probably paying for that now and with his own body being in the shape that it is mm. i would like to say in 2018 that it is doing a lot better than what it was maybe 10 years ago mm. and when i say mick retired from full-time wrestling he did wrestle matches just infrequently Mm. Uh, he sporadically wrestled a few matches for WWE he wrestled for another company TNA handful of matches there but Mick nowadays is actually doing a lot better than what he was he actually started doing DDP yoga and it has actually improved his you know physical mobility Mm. so I think Mick is seeing brighter days in terms of his mobility and I want to end that on a, a happier note just quickly I just want to like. I know the we're in the attitude era here, mm-hmm. and the main target audience is young adults. Yep, there were kids in this audience here. I very distinctly remember that first shot you showed me of Jim Ross and Jerry. Whoa, Jerry the King Waller. Jerry the King Waller. Lawler. Waller. Lawler. Lawler. <laughs> there was kids, right? <laughs> I know they say, I know they say, you know, they have the thing at the start, don't try this at home. These are professionals. Yes. Kids still do them. You know, what kid hasn't choke slammed their friend? My brother used to do that stuff. People are going to copy the wrestlers. Doing this stuff and having that encouraged going, he's, you know, he's put the fans above himself totally disagree with that you don't you don't agree with totally that totally disagree with that you should not be commended Even, putting yourself in that much risk when it's like 
you know, you could die. And I mean, he didn't die. Someone else who does that could very well easily die. Obviously. Someone in a, you know, independent promotion who's trying to make it big, who wants to break through, he's really desperate, looks to the, you know, the greats, the immortals at WWE or WWF at the time, you know, they're not totally disagree with that. But do you think that is a a mentality that should be under kayfabe or do you think that should be something that you know talking directly to the viewers that hey do not try this yeah look at the result of it where mick foley is you know maybe do you think it's it's something that they could work into kayfabe or do you think it's just something that's a shoot i think talking it would, directly to the audience i think it would have to be you know if they want to do stuff like this yeah the right way to it can't be in kayfabe it would have to be them you know having like five minute shoot promo yeah that's like you know vince talking says look i've got to take a moment to be serious here guys yeah this is what happened on friday night or whatever night it was yeah. hell in a cell this is totally unacceptable for the wwf mick put himself through insane risk and insane injury this is totally not acceptable and we do not want any of our wrestlers to put themselves through this high level of risk where there is a very real very real risk of death or permanent paralyzation because it's already risky like especially when there's kids watching i mean it doesn't sound like there was any stories of any kids doing this luckily i mean the i mean i've always heard stories of kids jumping off roofs but i guess with the wwf or wwe they've always kind of wiped their hands clean of this kind of stuff and they they put out their warning and that is their sort of saving grace is that they do warn the viewers prior to it but it I can't them from suing. I, yeah, that stops them from their own legal ramifications. You know, we didn't hear about any of the kids getting injured. Yeah. But, you know, there might have been. Um, sure, it saves them from being sued. Yes. But I think as a company, it's a moral responsibility. You can't encourage that kind of behavior. I think it was more of a testament to the wrestling business as a whole as opposed to just the WWE. I think it was a case of... Because in wrestling, you're mm. often kind of rewarded for the... or celebrated for the work you put in and for the hard work you put in. You were celebrated for that. You were commended for that. Mm. And I think it's more of a mentality that Mick taking these sort of risks yes they should not be taken by everybody and no it's not expected of everybody but he has done what he has done i think the worst thing you could probably do for his own sake is condemn him that he's done the absolute worst horrible deplorable thing that he could ever have done because i think he himself was probably hoping that he does get some sort of adulation or some sort of um, props or recognition that, you know, the risks he took were worth it in the end. Mm. That he would get the respect from his peers or the respect from the fans. And, that, like, that is a mentality of the wrestling business. I'm not saying in, mm. in the real world this mentality doesn't happen. Yeah. You know, in any other workplace or in any other environment. It's just this is the mentality of the wrestling business where it's you've you put in the hard work, you get commended for it. And Mick put in the hard work and he got commended for it. But is is doing damage to yourself hard work? Can't there be other... Like, isn't there's tons of other ways, I imagine, to put in hard work, to yeah. think of really technical stuff, to, you know, think of a creative, creative characters. Yeah. You know, fit yourself into different storylines, work with the you know the managers of the promotion rather than surprise 
everyone with unbelievable risk, you know. I mean, I don't want to say that everybody can do that. No. But, you know, because not everyone would actually have the guts to do that because it's insane. Yeah. But, hard to put it, but that should not be like an encouraged way of making it, I guess. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that's obviously the encouraged way to do it, especially the mentality nowadays. I think it's a lot more grounded to what the real world mentality would be. Mm. We're, we're obviously we're looking back at this 20 years later. You know, it was with, a different time, I suppose. With the, you know, benefit of foresight and, you know, a modern age that we're in in 2018, 1998, I don't think there would have been those health and safety standards yeah. as there are now or, you know, caring about the well-being of the wrestlers. Mm. Back then, you know, it was kind of a shark eat shark world, and to stand out, you probably had to do something pretty ridiculous. Mm. Whether it was jumping off something pretty high, or doing a wild and crazy character, or saying something really interesting and mm. different, people did stuff in their own ways, and this is the way Mick did it. Mm. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, Mick understands that it was a stupid risk. I'm sure, you know, in his own mentality that it wasn't something worth taking. Mm. But at the same time, I'm sure he he reaps the benefits of this risk as well because um, he went on to become a WWF champion three times after this. Mm. And I would say it was a direct result because of that risk. And he got notoriety out of his career because of that risk. Mm. And so a lot of benefits came from doing that. Mm. And so I don't think he would take that back for the world. I really don't think he would. Yeah. In terms of a moment in wrestling history, not just WWE, in terms of yeah. itself, it is an iconic match and obviously brings up a lot of uh, debated discussion as to why it should have happened, why it shouldn't have happened. But mm. at the end of the day, it is, you know, it, it's a memorable thing that every wrestling fan knows of and now you know of <laughs> Unfortunately. whether or not you like it or not <laughs> but you had to know of it you had to and that's all that matters oh here's a little tidbit for you the undertaker going into this match had also had a broken foot just to kind of add to all the other injuries and shit that was happening <laughs> the undertaker had a broken foot going into this oh yeah i mentioned before how the undertaker how would he agree to doing this throw. Do you know what The Undertaker's reaction was when Mick proposed the idea? Yeah, go on. Do you want to die, Mick? <laughs> Which is a very real response. <laughs> Do you want to die? <laughs> yeah. And it actually took a lot, a lot of convincing for uh, The Undertaker to actually agree to do it. Yeah. And obviously, it took a lot of persuasion for Mick to get permission from Vince to do it. I've heard a story where Mick kind of had to use a bit of reverse psychology on Vince to try and kind of persuade him <laughs> to get it done. Yeah. It's kind of funny. Foley and Terry Funk were brainstorming ideas about how to top the match. Terry Funk said, laughing, maybe you should let him throw you off the cage to Foley. And Foley replied back, yeah, then I could climb back up and he could throw me off again. And this is a quote from Mick. Man, that was a good one. And we were having a good time thinking completely ludicrous things to do inside, outside, and on top of the cage. After a while, I got serious and said quietly to Terry, I think I can do it. <laughs> and that's going to conclude the Danger Zone series uh, for this episode. Scott, how are you feeling now that you've witnessed probably the most extreme match in WWE and in wrestling history? I thought the... Uh, death core scene from the wrestler afterwards. I thought that was intense. The death match scene. Yeah. From the movie The Wrestler. Yeah. The death core scene. Fucking, I don't know. The fucking staplers and shit. <laughs> I thought that was intense. That was fucking babies shit. Like, I know, that compared was. Compared to this. That was a fucking walk in the park, you know. Doesn't matter if it was right or if it was wrong. 
it was intense. It was very, very intense and very, very real. Wrestling fake bullshit. Yeah. Just to let you know, this audio podcast is available on multiple platforms like YouTube on our channel. There will be a link in the description to that. Also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash restless radio. We are also on iTunes and player.fm. Links also there. Click them. Scott, anything else? Well, we're very active on our social media channels. We're always uh, commenting on different things and happenings and sometimes posting memes when we think of something really creative and really cool. Get those creative juices flowing. Yeah, if you could like those, that'd be really nice. Yeah, we'd love to see some interaction. We'd love to see some audience participation in our podcast. Yeah, so we're very much looking forward to someone... uh, talking to us first person to give us a comment 10 out of 10 you will definitely get your comment on the show well your brother's commenting on it at least i think that's that's a good start yeah but he's not suggesting us to do anything yeah he is just saying like nice man yeah he's not being very helpful in terms of feedback and whatnot ask us a question and we'll answer it make yourself known to us is the main gist we're getting at here be our number one fan. <laughs> Jeez, do you want to make it any more sadder? <laughs> Thanks once again for listening. I've been Julian. And I'm Scott. And we'll see you next time on Restless Radio.